This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week spent many months living in Gaza in 2014 during Israel's last war on the Strip in which more than 2,000 people were killed. Because of this, he knows many people who still live in Gaza. He knows many people who have died in Gaza. He knows many more who have lost an arm or a leg or an eye. He also had a very close encounter with Hamas itself. I think you will learn a lot from listening to him. This is my interview with Dan Cohen. I am joined from Washington, D.C. by Dan Cohen, who um, is a journalist and the co-producer, maker of the film Killing Gaza, which... Um, is one of the most extraordinary pieces of journalism I've ever seen. Um, it is what I wish journalists would do these days. So few, almost none do it, and certainly not in Gaza. Um, you and Max Blumenthal were on the ground in Gaza for seven months and maybe more total, and everyone needs to watch this documentary. There is no way you can watch it without being deeply affected and also seeing more importantly how israel operates um, on the ground because you were actually in gaza filming during the 2014 war which was quite similar to what's going on now just maybe slightly smaller scale but um and we'll talk about that i want to talk of course about what gaza is what it was like for you being in gaza but more importantly what it is like for people in gaza to live there of course a lot of inside information that is very hard to to access for us living outside there but let's i want to start actually because you're you're not just working on that and you're you're doing a lot of work um on what's happening now and i think for me first and foremost and i know you're this is one of your principal priorities is is getting to the bottom of what happened on october 7th and i've been focused on that pretty um squarely because obviously so much of what is happening now was predicated on the claims about what happened on October 7th. Um, so let's just talk about that. And then I also want to talk about just sort of the politics in Israel right now. Another key part of this, it's what are the intentions of this government? What is the mood of the population in Israel? Um, and you know, and you've spent a lot of time in Israel too, so you know that very well. So let's start there. Start with going on what's with what's going on right now and those particular political questions. And then let's get into what it is to be a person in Gaza. So let's so I've been called, of course, just like you, a conspiracy theorist, yada, yada, yada. And most importantly, all of our other ideas about the conflict get dismissed when we even raise a question about what actually happened on October 7th. Um, there has been reporting by Haaretz and Gray Zone and others showing, I believe, pretty clear evidence that Israel responded to the initial attacks on October 7th with a massive bombardment by multiple Apache helicopters and many, many tanks. Um, and they didn't, and we also know that the the soldiers in the helicopters and the tanks were saying they weren't aware of what exactly they were shooting at. They were told to shoot houses, B-52 
because they believed terrorists were in the uh, houses, but didn't know for sure if there were other civilians. But I am now, I've just seen more and more of this evidence. And then to me, though, the reason I am so skeptical of this, well, multiple reasons, but I think, I guess, and this is what I haven't really heard anybody just narrow in on. We know that from the first second of October 2nd, since then, every second, Israeli government officials, IDF official spokespeople, and of course, all of their supporters in the Western world have said repeatedly over and over things that did not happen. So the beheaded babies, the 40 beheaded babies, they repeated, they're still talking about it somehow, um, but for at least a month, it was they couldn't mention the conflict without beginning with their 40 beheaded babies. Mass rape was the other one um, that they constantly invoke. Um, there is still zero evidence of either. Um, but here's the question. I think there were some civilians killed on October 7th. I think that's pretty likely. I think it's almost for sure. Why could, and that's a war crime. And then taking hostages as well is a war crime. Everyone in the universe would agree with that. Isn't that enough to justify whatever you're about to do? Why is it that the Israeli government and its propagandists and its supporters have obsessively, almost exclusively focused on, on claims of things that did not happen? Um, right? And so that, to me, suggests that they are trying to hide something or cover something. And I have a theory about that, but I'd love to hear what you, what you think. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks a lot for having me yeah, on you. the show. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you, Thad. Um, I mean, from the very moment, you know, the news alerts started to come out about on October 7th, we immediately saw a shock and awe style propaganda campaign in order to portray those events in mm -hmm. a very specific hyper politicized way that what happened was the most heinous attack since the Holocaust. We heard a lot, of course, trying to link Hamas to Nazis, to German Nazis, um, and of course, link Palestinians, therefore, to Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, we heard all kinds of claims, first about rape. Uh, we saw horrible videos of people being dragged away. It wasn't exactly clear who they were being dragged away by, whether it was mm -hmm. regular Palestinian civilians from Gaza, who got out uh, behind Hamas or Hamas themselves. And there was a total conflation, mm. um, which which is very, very important to understand because, right. I mean, you'll have, you know, there's, mm. you have Hamas fighters who, of course, got out, but then you have a lot of just Palestinians who were in Gaza who got out too, um, who may not be as disciplined as the Qassam fighters and may do, you know, things that the Qassam fighters wouldn't. Um, so. It's really there are so there in in my opinion there are more questions than answers about October seventh at this point. We do know a lot of people were killed. How many exactly? I, uh, I mean, it was originally the Israelis said fourteen hundred. That has recently been downgraded to twelve hundred. Mm. How many of those were Israeli soldiers and police? Mm. Quite a few. I think at least several hundred of those. I don't know what the exact official numbers are. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, if you look at proportionality, well, Israel's killing. So when it when it bombed Jabalia refugee camp and that huge bombing about a week and a mm -hmm. half ago, yep. they killed 300, roughly 300 civilians, and they claimed that they got one Hamas militant. Well, that's extremely dis disproportional, even if it's true. Yet when this attack on October 7th, well, if they got several hundred occupation forces and may have killed, let's say worst case scenario, they killed a few hundred civilians too, which is horrible. No one's questioning that. Within the rules, the laws of proportionality, that's a completely different thing than what Israel do, does. By those, by Israel's logic, it's much more justifiable. Mm -hmm. um, we saw... All kinds of claims, as you said, about beheaded babies, 40 beheaded babies, um, which immediately, I mean, that was an obvious deception from the beginning, as if, you know, they were, I mean, it, it's just totally absurd. But it, the claim that originated with uh, the um, Israeli uh, media um, network, I-24, 
that quickly fell apart. But as soon, even though it was debunked, and the uh, Nicole Tzedek, the the reporter who initially put it out, just basing her claims off of her reporting based based off of claims from Israeli journalists, or I'm sorry, Israeli soldiers that she spoke to, right? Um, who were taken on a guided tour of uh, the Kibbutz Beri and Kfar Aza. Um, you know, that just spread like wildfire where we saw it repeated, like, I don't know, 100 or more times over the next week in the Western media to where people believed it. People still believe it. I did a piece um, for, for my outlet, Uncaptured Media, where we where I basically showed how this um, lie took off between Nicole yep. Tzedek, the Israeli, yep. prop- the Israeli prime minister's mm-hmm. office, um, CNN reporter Sarah Sidner who is a longtime propagandist who spread fake claims uh, about um, mass rape in Libya in order to justify Mm. NATO intervention. And Mm -hmm. that was completely faked. Well, Mm -hmm. she did the same thing with these beheaded baby stories. So we saw that one take off. um, And I think it serves two purposes. One, to, I think you're right, to cover up what actually happened. So nobody's asking questions about, wait a minute, did the Israelis go in and to a hostage situation and then just open fire on everyone and just kill a bunch of people? Mm-hmm. What actually happened here? Those are very serious questions that need to be investigated. But instead of critical thinking, uh, it became 40 beheaded babies. We have to bomb Gaza now because, you know, Hamas is worth worse than terrorists or worse than Nazis. You know, they're worse than ISIS. This yeah. became the media, the propaganda line, um, yeah. which was totally detached from reality. And then secondly, to generate bloodlust in the Israeli public and the Western public, because who could ever, uh, you know, justify or, you know, we can't live with these kinds of animals who would behead babies. So this is so it's and it, and it very much did generate bloodlust. We saw statements in the in the following days from people like Ron DeSantis, the Republican presidential hopeful, who said that he would never allow anyone from Gaza into the United States, even if they're against Hamas, because they're all anti-Semitic. And then that turned into actual physical attacks and murders of Palestinians. We saw this six-year-old uh, Palestinian boy in Chicago stabbed, I think, 26 or 28 times to death. Mm-hmm. Um, so the level of incitement that those lies about October 7th were used to create uh, are despicable. And we're in this kind of like, you know, September 12th, Islamophobic, anti-Arab uh, atmosphere, um, and of course that does generate anti-Semitism too. Um, you know, because Israel wants everyone to conflate its actions with Jews overall mm-hmm. as a whole, mm-hmm. and so then you have people who will oblige what the state of Israel asks and don't understand that there is a very huge difference between Judaism and Zionism, and that the two are actually very much at odds. But Israel uses and Zionists use judaism as a human shield so then you know jews in the street can be attacked but overall i think the incitement the official incitement from our from elected officials from uh uh from media figures is not directed at jews it's directed at muslims so Mm. islamophobia and anti-semitism are closely related but the Mm. islamophobia is is far far worse in this country so i think october 7th has just been distorted so much that what we really need is some kind of impartial international investigation into what exactly went on. Um, And in fact, that's what Hamas has called for. Hmm. But the Israelis, of course, do not want that. So, um, you know, it's Hmm. October 7th is is a key event that needs to be closely studied and examined. Hamas has called for an international investigation. I know you're right. An investigation in Israel, of course, has not. And Almost certainly will never. Um, I think the chances of that are pretty much nil unless they're forced into it by the U.S. But this is what I mean. It's just I've been screaming inside since day one about this thing. Why do they keep talking about stuff that we know didn't happen instead of why can't they talk about the dead? I mean, taking civilians hostages. That's a war crime. That's terrible. Can we just focus on that? So what I'm saying is what I'm getting to is I suspect that what happened on October 7th was essentially, essentially a normal military campaign, a normal military operation that, like in almost all military operations, took civilian casualties. 
Um, and that's what happens in war. We all know this. This is not a reason to think it was a good thing or anything, but that it, that it was a normal, regular military operation instead of a rampage by barbarians who are inhuman, irrational, sadistic, um, and essentially berserk. And so therefore there's no, there's no political solution with them. There's no talking with them. There's nothing you, I mean, I would agree if they actually were monsters, then you do have to bomb all of them. Of course. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, now, and we can go on and on. We will go on about like, what is the, what is the nature of the Palestinian consciousness inside of Gaza? But is this, does Hamas strike you as an irrational organization? Um, maybe in some ways, and they are, but that that is what the claim is, right? That this was this had no sort of rational purpose. It was simply just Jew hatred let loose, right? It was just a bunch of people who just hate Jews and they got across the border and they just slaughtered Jews. Nothing rational about it. Um, that's I sort of doubt that. I sort of doubt that, you know, a military organization, a political organization that's been around for decades is just run by this impulse to kill Jews. I would have to think there was something rational about it. But what do you think? I mean, I can speak for personal experience yeah, from personal exactly. experience with with Hamas right. in terms of how they treated me as a Jew specifically. When I was in Gaza, there was one time where I was in a neighborhood called Shijaiya, which is to the east of Gaza, an area that when I was there was east of Gaza basically... City. It's in Gaza, but it's east of Gaza City. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. East of Gaza City. It's right. It, so yes, it's on it's it's directly east of Gaza City, basically uh, up against the the fence um, right. uh, with a little bit of uh, farmland in between. But it's the closest to to the fence, um, the closest area to the fence east of mm -hmm. Gaza City. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was there, I would so I so I was in basically the rubble in these homes that are bombed out, and I went into this this house uh, with with my friend at the time who uh, you know is from Gaza, and this house was had huge holes in the walls, totally bombed out, living in the cold. There, two of the sons from this family were Qassam fighters, Hamas fighters, who were killed. There were big posters, um, you know, uh, uh, of their faces and that they're martyrs. And mm -hmm. and I spoke to the father at length, and I at one point said to my friend, you know, do you think I could tell this guy that I'm Jewish? Like, I don't, I like to be real with people. I want to actually connect with these people that I'm, you know, breaking bread with. And he was like, yeah, okay, let's tell them. Hmm. And the guy, the the father, an older man, probably sixty years old, um, he said, oh, you know, my wow, that's amazing. My, you know, I have friends in when I was a laborer in Israel, you know, back before the the siege and, and before there was very little uh, movement of Palestinians going to work inside Israeli territory, I had Jewish friends and this and that. And, and he was, he was thrilled. Um, so the next day I got a call from Hamas security and <laughs> they tell me, come, come, come to our office. We need to speak with you. <laughs> and they sat me down and I was like, I don't know what this is about. And they sat me down and they're like, you cannot tell people that you are Jewish because, you know, something bad could happen. Not everyone understands the difference between Jews and Zionists and Israelis, mm -hmm. and you could get yourself in hot water. Um, so don't tell anyone. So Hamas was actually protecting me because I was Jewish. They gave me an extra level of essentially protection, knowing that I'm a Jewish guy walking around the rubble and anything could happen to me at any point, but nothing ever did. Nobody demanded to know or anything like that. So the idea that, I mean, I get messages from Zionists on a daily basis, hoping, you know, go to Gaza and you'll see Hamas, you know, will kill you just the same. And I'm like, well, actually I did. And they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, hmm. so what does that say about Hamas? Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe Zionists would say like, oh, well, you're just a useful idiot for them. Right, right. But it's still, it, I mean, they can think that, but the fact is they had the opportunity to do whatever kind of harm to me because I'm Jewish that they wanted to, and they didn't. So the idea that they killed Jews just for the sake of being Jews right. is simply not true. Um, it's, I mean, it's debunked right there. Um, so what does that say about Hamas overall? To me, it shows a level of pragmatism. 
And this is what I think we see from Hamas overall. They've never had any kind of problems negotiating with the Israelis, whether usually indirectly through Egypt, through Qatar. Um, they've developed diplomatic contacts around the world. Mm -hmm. I, I recently interviewed Dr. Bassem Naim, who is uh, now, he's a former health minister in Gaza, um, affiliated with Hamas. And he was recently in Russia meeting with the deputy foreign minister. He told me he's had secret meetings with European officials. He has good relations with Gulf, you know, Gulf countries. So they're very much pragmatic politically. Um, and I think the whole October 7th operation was not designed to be some horrible massacre as it's been portrayed or even really to target civilians so much more. It was designed to one, kill some enemy soldiers mm -hmm. two to bring soldiers or whoever back into the Gaza Strip so they could be used to extract concessions from the occupation. In 2006, when Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, was taken captive, five years later, he was exchanged in another pragmatic move by Hamas for roughly 1,050 Palestinian prisoners. So I think Hamas's logic was, well, if we take a lot more than, we're going to get a lot more than one uh, Israeli soldier, then we can extract real concessions, like major concessions, get all of our prisoners back, which has been a key demand. There are more than 5,000 Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Um, and also then we could, they could demand, end the siege, lift the blockade, end the occupation. And so when they got, you know, at first it was something like reported like 100, and then it became 150, 200. Now it's something like 250 hostages Reportedly, something like 60 are dead uh, mm -hmm. from Israeli bombardment. Mm -hmm. It's you know unclear what exactly the real numbers are, how how true any of any of those numbers are. But clearly, there are many hostages in Gaza. That would give Hamas uh, huge leverage to nego negotiate. But I mean, I actually when that happened, I tweeted like checkmate. Like <laughs> they got a bunch of people. Israel now has to negotiate. And instead, what did Israel do? No, we're just going to bomb everyone. And so it's like it's it's Israel like out crazied Hamas, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, you know, you can talk about the Hannibal Directive, this protocol to to kill um, Israeli soldiers from Israel to kill, kill Israeli soldiers in order to prevent negotiations. I like Hos hostages. Kill Israeli hostages. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Right, kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. But mm -hmm. a protocol by the Israeli military to kill Israeli hostages i mean technically it's about its own soldiers who are taken captive right. um but right. i mean i think clearly the, the logic would be applied to civilians as well sure. um because the, you know they're very valuable too mm -hmm. so is that what's being applied in gaza is that what's being is that what was applied on october 7th like let's minimize the number of hostages they can take by just killing everyone mm -hmm. there was an order that came down from above we know that from israeli reporting uh, to open fire on these homes where hostages were held up with uh, Hamas militants. So, I mean, again, there are more questions than answers about that overall. But the reporting we do sh we have seen shows a very different picture than what we're be what we've been presented with in the media. Mm -hmm. And overall, I mean, you know, Hamas has shown it's still willing. To, it's still willing to negotiate uh, these prisoners and has tried. Um, and even gave up to Israeli prisoners for nothing in exchange uh, because of of health reasons. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, humanitarian concerns Two elderly ladies. And when one of those elderly ladies was released, she actually shook the Qassam militants hand and said, peace. Shalom. And then she she gave yeah she, when she gave a press conference saying that she was basically treated fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the 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 like the director of the hospital who allowed that was denounced and the channel was, and it became a huge you know, propaganda disaster for Israel because it showed Hamas not being these, you know, Nazi ISIS supervillains that you just have to exterminate. And there's no other, other choice. They want it to be as bad as possible to give them the pretext to ethnically cleanse Gaza like they're doing now. Right. That, yeah. I, I think maybe the crucial thing to do, in all of this is, and I know that you do this, is to separate Zionism from Jews. Um, they're different things. And 
yesterday I interviewed Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, um, who is a brilliant, uh, he's not even an anti, it's a very complicated argument, basically, his argument is essentially this, that it's, they're different, and not only different, that Zionism and Israel are idolatrous and anti-Jewish and anti-Judaism, but anyway, um, so I'm quite, I'm wondering whether Hamas and I guess we call, you know, Palestinian militants generally do that, do they separate the Jew from the Zionist, the Jew from the Israeli. I know that in Hamas's original charter of 1988, it's full of references to killing Jews and eliminating Jews and driving Jews out. And boy, that looks like it's just anti-Semitism. The revised charter 2017, is that right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, is very different. And now I don't know exactly what went into that. And I'm not suggesting that they just completely changed their minds overnight, but it's very clear in much of that charter, I it's hard to disagree with because it's most it's it's it makes that distinction very clearly in the charter they say i don't have the language with me but it says zionists are different than jews we are opponents of zionists in the state of israel who have been our enemies from the beginning not jewish people like dan cohen they don't say that but you know it's not it is not it's, it's a very deliberate attempt to distance themselves from anti-semitism um when they went across the border were they looking for jews or were they looking for israelis um, did they want to kill Jews or kill Israelis? This is crucial because if they want to kill Jews, then they're racist, irrational, sadistic, and of absolute no value. And I wouldn't mind wiping them out entirely. Um, and it's not a legitimate resistance because all Jews are not the oppressors of Palestinians. Jewish people are not the oppressors of Palestinians, but um, you can certainly argue that Israelis have been. Um, so... Is that something that you sort of sensed on the ground that, and I don't mean just among, well, I guess I'd like to hear from about from you about sort of just ordinary people on the ground in Gaza, people who you might consider to be militant, if not actual fighters, and then the fighters themselves, do they draw those distinctions? Yeah, overall, I mean, Palestinians understand that Jewish and Palestinian are not contradictory terms in fact there were palestinian jews that's who, right you know um i mean the in in 1929 the palestinian jewish community of hebron was wiped out because zionist fanatics were agitating around holy sites in order to uh, european zionist fanatics who would you know were colonizing palestine we're agitating in, to in order to create sectarian clashes to divide um, along religious lines. So Palestinians in general understood, oh, our, our, you know, Jews are attacking us. So there were, so there were riots, there was killing and the, and the Palestinian Jews were wiped out. There were also Palestinian Jews that were hid, that were, that were helped, that were saved by their neighbors. And so now if you go to Hebron, um, there's like a, f a fanatical, uh, Israeli settler mm -hmm. colony there, mm -hmm. and they and they claim that oh see they victimized us back in 1929 they wiped us out but now we're back and it's like no they're like you know they're pretending to be the Palestinians who's who were wiped out because of their activities because of Zionist activities so it's all about creating sectarian divisions in uh, Palestinian society that's what what mm. uh zionists tried to do early on and in some mm. in some ways very much succeeded in but it's like if you talk to palestinians in general you, often they will say yahud which means you know jew but they are not referring to jews in right. new york city or los this, angeles they're talking about their occupiers this is it and yeah. and like they'll leave you know they'll they'll describe when you when you when they make that distinction they'll actually um often describe Jews as their cousins because they because mm. you know they're all from Abrahamic faiths. Mm -hmm. So this mm. whole idea that Hamas was targeting Jews just for the sake of being Jewish is just not based in material reality. You can't mm -hmm. get, I mean, Pal you cannot get Palestinians to go out and attack a bunch of Israelis unless there are material conditions that compel them to do it, like siege, like occupation, like being bombed, shot, starved, displaced, ethnically cleansed for decades and decades. That is what is driving them. It's not some, you know, uh, 
um, religious or racist ideology fundamentally. It's right. material. It's material conditions, and so um, as much as Zionists would like to make this fundamentally about a about religion, and you know, you see like wealthy American Jews in Los Angeles and New York City shivering in their in their mansions that some like Hamas terrorist is going to pop out of a tunnel in Beverly Hills. It's just not based in reality. You're talking about people who are resisting uh, the most brutal conditions that they don't know anything about. And unless you actually take an honest look about what the conditions in Gaza are, what Zionism has meant for Palestinians, nowhere more than in Gaza, then you're never going to understand what's actually happening. Yeah, well, you neglected the the Jewish kids at Harvard, um, which I'm very concerned. Oh, yeah, about. right. Um, as a former professor at Columbia University, um, I can say all of this concern about the Jewish students in the Ivy Leagues is just, I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, so <laughs> um, as an aside, I suppose, you mentioned Hebron, and I've been telling people, um, if you just learn one thing, just go watch any video or learn or read about anything about Hebron. Just any, I don't care, even any source pretty much. Just go go learn about Hebron. 800 Jewish uh, settlers, uh, Israeli settlers in the middle of a city full of Palestinians. Um, and the IDF is protecting these people. And there's checkpoints. How many checkpoints are there in Hebron that you have to cross through and you can be kept in the checkpoint? However long the guards want to keep you. It's an instrument of sadism. It's just obviously apartheid. I mean, I don't even know how anybody can see that happening and still want to send money to Israel. Um, but that's just an aside, just anybody listening, please just go learn anything about Hebron, spend five minutes and you will be so appalled um, and amazed if you don't know about this. Um, let's talk about Israel. Now you've spent also quite a bit of time in Israel. You have connect many connections to Israel. I think you know that society fairly well. Um, and you can talk about, you know, the extent of your connections to it if you want, but, um, and to me, this may be the second most important thing that people are missing is what's going on inside the Netanyahu government and has been going on, what these people think, what they want, what they intend. Uh, again, to me, the evidence is just so big at this point of we have so many statements by not just you know, fringe members of the Likud party, but we have, of course, members of Netanyahu's cabinet major ministers in the Israeli government who are settlers, who are openly racist and always have been, who have always called for uh, the expulsion of all Palestinians from the land of Israel. Um, they want it all, don't they? Or do they just want North? I mean, what is, what, how do you read it? Uh, what are they going for? And what is, what is Israeli popular opinion now? I mean, what, where do you think the government is headed? What do they want here? Well, ever since the 2005 so-called disengagement from yeah. Gaza, uh, overseen, ordered by Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, which saw 8,000 Israeli settlers forcibly removed from the Gaza Strip, there has been a large segment, basically the Israeli right wing, has wanted to take over Gaza again, and but not just establish little settlements and have a few thousand people there to fully ethnically cleanse all of the Gaza Strip. Because according to the logic of Zionism, the, the mythology of Zionism, that is all Jewish land. Um, and so no one else can be there. And if they are, they have to submit to the so-called Jewish state or they will be killed or they can flee uh, if they're lucky. Um, that plays a huge role in what Israeli society is thinking, and they're, they're, that movement uh, to, to reconquer Gaza and ethnically cleanse it basically was brought to the fore by the events of October 7th. So October 7th was a pretext for the Israeli government to enact longstanding plans to ethnically cleanse Gaza. We can look at the subjugation plan presented by the finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, mm -hmm. which uh, was presented in 2017 as basically a final solution for the Palestinian problem, where he gave he presented three options. One, to um, submit 
and be essentially a slave to live under the what are called the Noahide laws, in which uh, you uh, are not allowed no no idol worship, as they would call it. So no Christianity, no Islam, all the mosques, all the churches are destroyed. You basically live as a slave. Secondly, you can uh, flee. You can be ethnically cleansed. Or third, if you resist, you'll be killed. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what Smotrich presented in a public plan called the subjugation plan. That's the that's the Hebrew translation for it. That's not even my description. Um, I mean, we've also seen a number of documents. There were think tanks and an Israeli um, intelligence uh, ministry document that came out in the early, you know, in the first couple of weeks of this uh, following October 7th that called for the full ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Um, so basically the there's the long-standing debate in Israeli society on the left, where you have permanent support for permanent apartheid, the status quo, as long as the Palestinians stay in their refugee camps or stay right. in Gaza and don't do anything, they can have some kind of you know economy based on foreign aid keeping them afloat. And every time they act up, we'll come in with the force of our military and have a very disproportionate response in order to teach them a lesson and establish deterrence and so-called peace and quiet in in the south or anywhere else whether it's the west bank or gaza um the right wing mm -hmm. has always said no 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 we're going to ethnically cleanse them fully we have to get rid of them we can't have an enemy living on our borders are you crazy which honestly makes a lot more logical sense because yeah. of course palestinians are going to be a hostile population because they're ethnically cleansed and they're exactly. under subjugation so they're exactly. going to rise up mm -hmm. uh so that with october 7th that status quo permanent apartheid argument or or train of thought was totally permanently discredited. Now, the right wing of full ethnic cleansing, which had already been gaining power and more and more power, it had the pretext to be enacted and take over completely. So where even like, you know, liberals in Tel Aviv who had been pro protesting against Netanyahu's uh, judicial overhaul, the judicial right. coup, all of that, all of a sudden those protests are gone, and a lot of those people are now in support of this genocidal war on Gaza. So um, it gave them the pretext to enact a whole a whole lot of not only ethnic cleansing of Gaza, but a lot of the uh, internal attacks on the kind of um, facades of Israeli democracy, the power of the Supreme Court, among other things, uh, that they couldn't do. So it's just a huge fascist kind of shift in Israeli society overall yeah. and, and and inside of all of Israeli controlled borders. So the, the tiny, the tiny, you know, few people who are anti-war are totally under siege are being locked up. Um, one professor, uh, one high school teacher, for example, who who criticized um, Israeli soldiers and and admitted that Israeli soldiers had raped Palestinian women before. He's now facing 10 years in jail. So, I mean, it's it's like it's kind of like Ukraine post 2014 coup and and then again post 2022 um you know Russian special military operation yeah yeah i mean i i started sort of teaching about the history of palestine and israel 20 years ago around 2003 2000, during the second intifada and that was right when i and i think many people saw a shift this big shift um that the left, there had been a left, there'd been a very large, substantial, powerful left wing in Israeli society and politics that, you know, was calling for a two state solution, et cetera. Um, and, but when they started blowing up buses in Tel Aviv, they changed. And I had friends who lived in Tel Aviv at the time telling me this. They were like socialist, Marxist, Zionist, right? Super peace oriented, you know, but they were like, nope, sorry. We got to go now. I mean, we got to go in. We got to take them out because these people are implacable enemies of us. Um, now, I think that, and I said this at the time, the analysis of the right wing, I think, was correct. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, Palestinians generally, um, do they accept the existence of a state of Israel, of a Jewish state where it is? I mean, I, I think not. I think I think I think they were right. I think the Second Intifada was evidence, and many other things in Palestinian culture and society and politics over the last twenty years have shown me that no, they don't accept it. Um, now, I happen to be on their side in that because I'm an anti-Zionist. Um, to me, that's not an offensive thing, to, uh, an offensive position to take. Um, but is that true? I mean, is there is there a desire for a two-state solution 
meaning is there any sort of um, acceptance of a Jewish state among Palestinians that's meaningful? I mean, I think the whole idea of a two-state solution that's been presented and kind of imposed um, on Palestine by the West uh, for for many, many, many years, even yeah, right. going back to hmm. you know the even going back to the UN partition plan, hmm. um, there are hmm. people who hmm. would have accepted accepted it and would accept it, but it's been totally discredited. Um, and I think you know Hamas, for example, has even accepted a two state solution. A, a state to this day it calls for a Palestinian state based on 1967 borders. Now, hmm. does that mean that Hamas? Um, in practicality, in reality, would accept it, and that all of its, um, you know, supporters would. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe its political leadership would. I, I'm guessing it's more of a of a political, um, a pra a, a politically pragmatic move because it knows that Israel is never going to accept that. So all they have to do is say, okay, we'll accept. The, we will accept. You know, this bare minimum. Um, but Israel won't. So it kind of shifts the the focus back onto Israel. Like we'll play ball, but Israel won't. Um, and Israel won't accept a two state solution. All of the the so called attempts at creating a two state solution have been totally phony and have have only been pretexts for Israel to confiscate and colonize more land, uh, and then to subjugate Palestinians and you know keep them in little cantons in the West Bank. Uh, separated from each other to prevent any an establishment of any kind of viable state. Right. But I mean, I think, you know, there's I, I can't imagine many Palestinians at this point want to live with Israelis and for good reason, uh, you know, but I mean, I think fundamentally what they actually want is to live in real peace, real security where they're able to visit their holy sites and travel around and be free Palestinians um, and have the same rights that everyone else has in in their indigenous land. And I mean, that's what I support. You know, that's it's a controversial position here in the United States. But I mean, a one state, de a democratic solution um, where, you know, all people have have the same rights. But it's been made into this like, you know, they, it's <laughs> when we talk about like freedom, it's that's taken as genocide, as, as a call for genocide of Jews by these disingenuous mm. politicians and fanatics mm. inside the United States who want to actually see genocide of Palestinians, who are supporting the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. So um, ultimately, I think people would accept it because it's it's really about fulfilling their basic human needs rather than, um, you know, the the this kind of permanent process of this permanent Nakba, this permanent ethnic cleansing. We believe in democracy, Dan, and what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, several decades has been exporting democracy. I don't know if you're aware of that project, but that is what we believe in. And we will fight and die for that. Um, and we have, and we forced many people, forced them to be democratic, um, but not the Palestinians. They don't get that because if they get the vote in the land that they have always occupied, and these are refugees from that land who live in Gaza, if you give them a vote in this place, uh, they will just kill Jews. They'll just use that political power to kill Jews and enact the, the second Holocaust. And that is exactly the argument that is made. And that is the only argument that is made. You can't give Palestinians the vote. You can enforce, you can impose democracy on the Iraqis and the Afghanis, but no, the Palestinians don't get the vote because they're bad people, um, is the argument. It's quite stunning. Quite stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> yeah, it's perfect, perfectly stated. Democracy for some, uh, you know, by by bombing, we're gonna bomb the democracy into you, and then uh, you know, but Palestinians, you don't you don't get democracy. You just get straight apartheid and and ethnic cleansing, also by bombing. So we'll just dress it up a little bit differently. They um, ha they have Palestinians have an inherent proclivity for violence and Jew hatred. It's just, we can't explain it. They just do. And so that's why we can't give them the vote um, because they keep doing these things. They keep killing Jews, which is true. They've just, they've been doing these terrible things since 1948, since before 1948, Dan, even in the 1930s, they were killing Jews. They just can't stop. So clearly there's something wrong with this particular population. And well, we even according according to Benjamin Netanyahu, it was, uh, it was the, the Mufti the Palestinian Mufti who gave Hitler the idea for for the Holocaust. Hitler didn't even 
He didn't even hate Jews. He liked Jews. And then the Mufti got into his ear. Well, these people uh, are wor they're worse than Nazis because, see, the Nazis were at least rational white people, you know, who right. made sort of rational decisions. Um, they just yeah. wanted to protect their German nation, you know, just like yeah. Israel wants to. They want to protect its its borders, even expand their borders a little bit. You know, Lebensraum. And yeah. Israel just wants to have a little Lebensraum in Gaza, you know. Hitler said that they the Nazis were the anti-Semites of reason and and the the Russians were the anti-Semites of emotion. And, it, you know, that's what the Palestinians are. They're just like the Russians. They're just they're anti-Semites, but they're stupid about it. So they, there's nothing you can do about them except kill them and, and get rid of them. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I can't really I can't think of why they would be so murderous toward Israelis um, um, except the entire history. So let's talk about <laughs> The history and let's let's talk about gaza because you've been there you know it um you know people there you know it quite well um and you not only were you there you were there in 2014 during the bombing uh bombs were going over your head i see i've seen the video you've you witnessed a person get uh pretty sure it was just executed by the idf because he didn't have a gun and they shot him repeatedly with space in between the shots i couldn't believe this the guy's standing in front of you and the idf sniper just takes him out repeatedly uh, it's you see the barbarity of what's going on in your film, Killing Gaza. Everyone needs to watch this. Um, but just imagine that was 2,100, I think, 2,100 dead in that campaign in 2014. So times whatever is what's going on now. Um, so 2014, you cross you cross in at the Erez crossing into Gaza with Max Blumenthal. Um, when, as I said, something very similar to now is going on then. So you're, you're, you're walking into a war zone. Um, what did it feel like when you got there? Oh, I mean, um, it's, you know, you, you, you drive, we drove from like, uh, Ramallah or maybe we were in, we were in Ramallah and we went to Gaza and you basically drive, you know, through the West bank and into Israel. And, and it's these big open, wide open spaces with, big beautiful fields and all kinds of grains growing hmm. and then you go through this totally dystopia dystopic ch series of checkpoints first controlled by israel then another one controlled by the palestinian authority then another one controlled by hamas hmm. and it feels like you're entering this kind of like underworld where there's nothing there's no wide open anything everything is built up around you it's like going into the warsaw ghetto is you know how i kind of mm -hmm. imagined it mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and at that point you know there's wanton destruction everywhere you know the the road going in was destroyed by israeli tanks that destroyed it for no other reason than just to collectively punish um you know, the first big set of buildings you see are all bombed out from days, you know, weeks and weeks, weeks of shelling. And there are little kids playing uh, in front of it, you know, three, four year old kids who are smiling, but have this deep trauma in their eyes that you can see. Um, we arrived on the first day of a five day ceasefire and went to that neighborhood, Shijaiya first. And we met people who's, who were coming out of UNRWA schools where they'd been sheltering to see what was left of their homes, to try to dig any of their belongings they could from the rubble, and were just in total shock. And these people were extremely warm and kind to us. Um, they One man even somehow managed to get fresh cold fruit for us to, to bring to us, even though his home was destroyed. I don't know how he did it. Uh, but they just you know told us what happened to them how their family members had been killed, uh, how they'd been bombed while they were sleeping in their homes, this kind of thing. Um, and so that was kind of, so we stayed for five days uh, and then the ceasefire ended. Max left and I stayed in Gaza and continued to film. Mm. And um, I was there. So on the, the last two nights before the final ceasefire, that's when Israel started taking out like big towers and they dropped bunker buster bombs on like 13, 14 story towers and just basically destroyed the skyline of Gaza. And these were not like Hamas headquarters or anything like that. These were like commercial buildings and residential, you know, mixed buildings. And it was just like the professional class that they were getting rid of mm -hmm. the whole neoliberal economy that was allowed to blossom during 
the years of like the Palestinian Authority, the 1990s after Oslo and 2000s was now being taken away. It was like Israel was like this privilege, we're taken away, we're going to destroy this middle class that had that had grown, and we're going to make you all impoverished. Um, and ironically, those kind of more middle class people are much less likely to support Hamas. Mm-hmm. So they're going after the people, you know, it's it's all about destroying the, soci- the society. Uh, something like a year later, I was at a, an Israeli military conference in Tel Aviv. I used to go to these things. And this and this recently retired Israeli general named Gershon Hakohen talked about the rationale for bombing those towers. And he said it's about sending a message just like Al Qaeda did on 9-11. So he's favorably comparing the Israeli military and its bombing of towers to the bombing of the Twin Towers in New York City, saying, you know, saying we're like a terrorist group, um, which I wouldn't disagree with. So, I mean, just it was totally shocking for me. I mean, you know, scary at times, but just seeing, you know, going to those bomb those buildings that had just been bombed uh, like an hour later and seeing people just walking around in total shock their lives completely upended they have no idea what to do with themselves um i mean it was that was a that was i I don't even have words for how extreme that experience was um so i basically continued to i stayed a few more days and i went um back and forth basically i was based in palestine for the next three years and mm-hmm. I went back and forth into the Gaza Strip as much as I could. I spent wow. a total of like seven months there wow. um, filming, staying with friends and, you know, just trying to document everyday life for people who were who couldn't rebuild their homes. You know, Israel wasn't allowing construction materials back into Gaza. So they were literally taking the rubble and trying to use that to reconstruct, you know, every piece of rebar that was bent and mangled they would use like um like a like a press to try to straighten it out for for reconstruction it was like it's like it, what it reminded me of is like you know a a, a five or a 10 year old kid kicking an anthill and the ants just try to rebuild it and reconstruct their hill and put it back together and then the, the kid kicks it again it's like that's the power difference right, um right so yeah and that that you know, through through the winter where, for example, a baby froze to death um, because their house couldn't be reconstructed. Um, and in the summer where I uh, saw people, you know, one, two years later living in shipping containers in the middle of the summer without any kind of um, any kind of air conditioning or anything baking in the Mediterranean heat. You know, I just I tried to document what it was like uh, after the foreign journalists leave and show people like what you know what was happening to gaza and it's kind of the prequel to this current uh like genocidal assault yeah absolutely uh you guys have footage it's just some of the most i don't even know chilling one of the most chilling things i've ever seen i mean there's much of that in your film but the one that one of the things that just kills me is the uh the bombing i guess of kuza or Hosea, I'm not. It's, there you go, Hosea. Yeah, that's right. Hosea, yeah. Um, which is right on the border. It's in Gaza, but it's right on the border. Um, it's on the eastern edge of Gaza, right? And I guess rockets allegedly came out of there. Is that what the pretext was for bombing? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely there were heavy clashes uh, yeah. between Israeli soldiers and and Qassam fighters in in Hosea. It's it's mm-hmm. like it's for, it's south. Of, there's like the Gaza Strip is not. Like there's Gaza, which is Gaza City and the surrounding environs. And then, but the Gaza Strip is like the whole area. Gaza is a certain area. Hosea is kind of like um, more in the, in the middle, um, almost to the South, but yeah, along that Eastern edge. Exactly. Right on the border. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and it's, I guess it's, it's video taken, I think from inside an Israeli tank. uh, Right. And that you can hear them talking, the commander giving the orders. And then you hear just a huge celebration when they, when they blow up what looks like most of the town. Um, Of a mosque. They and blew a mosque, up a mosque right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just chilling. But then the other thing that was just, as I mentioned earlier, this, and I, I'd love to hear more about this because I just can't get over this scene of the, I guess it was like humanitarian workers. This is during the ceasefire, right? You guys are walking around the rubble in Shujaia. Um, This is after the bombing. You're walking around the rubble and one a Palestinian is with you and a young guy and he walks, I guess, in front of you, maybe 10, 20 yards. Go ahead. I mean, what's the, what's that story? 
Yeah, I, we weren't actually there that day. That had happened okay. before. Okay. Um, and this guy, Salam Shamali, was his name. Uh, he was walking through the rubble of Shijaiya during a ceasefire looking for his family. Right. And he was accompanied by international volunteers, including uh, an American named Joe Katrin, who I think lives in New York City, mm. who's a, a good friend. Um, mm. And he had been living in Gaza for years at that point. Mm. And so mm. he and these other internationals accompanied Salem Shamali in order to find his family. And as they were walking through the rubble, Salem was shot by an Israeli sniper. And he falls down on the ground. And if you've ever seen Full Metal Jacket, that scene where like a uh, yeah. a, Viet a Vietnamese sniper um, shoots like one of the soldiers and they're laying out there and they, you know, want to go get, it's like that. I mean, yep. you know, so the sniper yeah. is just basically hunting people in this very dramatic scene and, and Salem is, is laying there on the ground bleeding out and you can hear them saying, you know, we got to, can we help him? They're going to shoot us. And, and, uh, and they, sh and then the sniper shoots him two more times and kills him on the spot. And so, I mean, it was just an ob a, a blatant war crime captured on camera with witnesses from many different countries um, during a ceasefire. And so when I was there, when Max and I were there, we went and interviewed the family of Salem Shamali. And right. what, what I remember most is his little brother, Wasim, who we interviewed on the spot. And mm -hmm. he talked about how Salem was his his you know his hero he took care of him and gave him candy and all this stuff and then a year later when i went to visit wasim shamali again we went to the grave of his brother salem i sat down with him there and he told me that he had decided he wants to become a resistance fighter he wanted to join the al qassam brigades and this kid is like 14 years old and so why because his brother was murdered by an israeli sniper and he has no way to he has he has no recourse he has no way to get justice so in place of justice he wants vengeance and who could blame him so when you so when we see you know these images of al qassam fighters this is what i think of these you know people who when they were kids or 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 young boys or young men they suffered some kind of horrible tragedy that compelled them to say no i'm going to give my life in order to get some kind of uh, vengeance for my family, whether, you know, my father, my mother, my brother, sister, whatever it was, and try to liberate myself and liberate my country and my people and give my life in in that in service of that goal. Imagine how many kids are like that are being produced right now. I mean, exactly. it's, it's unfathomable how many how many resistance fighters there are now uh, or future resistance fighters now. Um, and speaking of that, so you guys also, I think this was you, am I wrong? You, you guys, not embedded, but you, you went and took footage of um, not Hamas or Palestinian, uh, not Islamic Jihad in Palestine, but uh, the third biggest brigade, uh, which is part of the popular resistance committees, right? But it sort of looks like your typical Hamas fighting group. You were with them, right? Um, and you, how, did, how did that happen? What, how did you get that connection? Yeah, I mean, through a through a basically a friend in Gaza, mm -hmm. um, I was able to to go film with um these these fighters, and they're not, you know, they're they were not like um they're called the Nasser uh, Salah al Din brigades, um, and they were not like you know top fighters like Al Qassam or something like that, right. but they did they were involved, um, in like military operations, you know, putting IEDs around the fence and this and that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing, um. And so I went and filmed with them and they were very open with me. The first time we went to try to film uh, an Israeli drone appeared overhead. So we all had to scatter and, you know, we were filming in an, in an olive field, olive orchard in Gaza. And then we, we reconvened uh, the next day um, and managed to film. And I just filmed these guys doing their exercises, their military exercises mm -hmm. and asking them what motivates you. And, you know, they were, they, all just talked about occupation, the occupation, the occupation motivates me, which, you know, of course. Um, so, you know, none of them said anything about, we just want to kill Jews. So we just hate Jews so much, you know, because we, we read the, the protocols of the elders of Zion and, you know, it became clear to, no, it's, they are all living under occupation. They want to be able to live in their land and go pray at their holy sites or, you know, go to, 
go to where their ancestors were ethnically cleansed from um, and be able to live normal lives. And so that's why, you know, just like that, that's why they are willing to, to die. I mean, it's like what any, you know, American patriots who imagine themselves and it's like what we see in movies about like some foreign occupier coming into our land and, you know, we stand up and fight back, even if we know that that we're going to die, that maybe our sons or or their our grandchildren will be will be free someday. Like that's what Palestinians are doing. Right. And, and how many of those fighters have family members who have been killed? Right. I mean, yeah, it's it's impossible to know, but I mean, you you can really you can't find anybody in Gaza who has not lost a family member, whether it's an immediate family member or a cousin or some. I mean, everybody, and especially now with you know one percent of the population wiped out, everybody knows somebody if it's not you know in their in their family who's been killed by Israel. I mean, it's just like it, the, everyone, and if and if they haven't been killed. They've been maimed, you know, how many people have lost limbs and how many people, you know, have severe burns. I mean, over the decades, everybody, you know, there's 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 just no one in Gaza in particular that hasn't uh, been directly affected in a very serious, painful way by the occupation. You guys were in a in a I think it was with the family of the guy who was murdered by the sniper maybe but it was you were you're in sort of a living room with a family in gaza and like i don't know like maybe eight or ten people there and what it was like a half of them were missing a limb or were bandaged up or limping or i mean it was just like oh okay this is what's happening here um yeah that that was actually uh that was the the sister of uh, or those were the siblings of a girl in a wheelchair uh who was who was killed by israel right right i mean yeah um, so I've been curious about something else, uh, again, about sort of what people in Gaza are thinking, uh, about Hamas, you know, we now know, and for God's sake, Netanyahu basically admits it, that, you know, he at least played a major role in establishing Hamas by, you know, helping to send it a billion dollars over several years through Qatar and all, all these other things. I mean, it's not even contested. That's what's amazing to me that like he openly explicitly said, um, all good. Um, and did are is there any awareness of that within Gaza about Hamas's origins and its relation to Israel? Is that allowed to be spoken? I mean, do people know about that? Yeah, I mean, there's no, you know, I think no question to Palestinians that they know that Hamas was funded by, um, you know, foreign entities. It had relations with Qatar, um, with Turkey, and you know, those countries have have you know, poured fun, poured funds into Gaza and done all kinds of PR. I remember when I was there, there was like, um, Turkey was funding weddings, you know, for young couples who couldn't afford to get married, because there's, you know, no kind of op- economic opportunity in Gaza. And so it's you know kind of a PR move. Um, so, I mean, yeah, nobody, I don't think it's any secret that that Hamas has, you know, basically Netanyahu allowed Hamas to be funded because the whole the whole game with Gaza, Israel's whole strategy was to keep it kind of on life support. So to keep it because it basically served Israel's purposes, uh, having Gaza beca- as a big concentration camp because you could have, you know, millions of Palestinians in a very, very small amount of space. So then you're free to focus on uh, colonizing more larger and more research resource rich areas like the West Bank. That strategy obviously has been, you know, blew up in Israel's face and has been totally discredited even among Israelis themselves. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I think some people have taken that fact that Netanyahu secured basically allowed Hamas to be funded as mm-hmm. Israel created Hamas. <clears throat> Hamas is a totally organic Palestinian movement. Okay. Uh, it arose as a response in many ways to the corruption of Fatah and the, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the kind of um, resistance movements that have that had grown um, in previous decades that were more secular. And so at the very beginning, it was like a charity movement in the 80s. And then it slowly grew and developed an armed wing. And and Israel certainly put its fingers on the scales at that point, because its whole strategy was to keep Palestinians divided. So and this is, you know, to until October 7th, the idea was like, okay, we'll have 
Hamas in power in uh, Gaza and have the Palestinian Authority in power in the West Bank, which you know doesn't have any. It's it's hardly Palestinian and doesn't have any authority. It's just a collaborator regime funded by the European Union and United States and Israel mm. to repress Palestinian resistance and keep this artificial. Uh, neoliberal aid economy based in Ramallah going, but as long as Israel maintained that division, then they could say, well, there's this, we can't have a Palestinian state in the first place because they're divided. So that was the whole strategy, yeah. but it doesn't change the fact that, of course, Hamas is like a real organic movement. Right. With real roots in the community. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the cynicism of Netanyahu is just is breathtaking, but what else is new? So I know you have to go soon. Um, I just want to finish by maybe offering people listening something to do or focus on that is positive and maybe constructive. And I, to me, one thing that's really important that, again, you're highlighting in your work is people within Israel and, and even people with some power in Israel who want to cease fire and and actually and want to end the occupation and want to give civil rights to Palestinians, et cetera. Very few of them, as we said, the the left and the peace movement in Israel has been decimated over the last 20 or so years, but there are still some, including this man who's quite remarkable, who's in the Knesset, named Ofer Kasif. And you've I think you've interviewed him or you've done work with him, and I've seen him. Um, a remarkable guy, uh, who I think his friend was killed on October 7th. Um, and just let's finish just by talking about what he's doing and what maybe people can look at inside Israel that's that's hopeful. Yeah, well, so yeah, Ofer Kassif is a member of Knesset of the Hadash party. Um, he is one of the most principled people I know. And he is, you know, who in a post-apartheid Israel, Palestine, would be the perfect kind of guy, mm -hmm. uh, perfect kind of figure to be a leader from the Jewish-Israeli side. Um, you know, he really cares about all of the, the country's inhabitants, Israelis, Palestinians, um, and but he's totally marginalized and he's one of the most hated figures among the Israeli right. Mm. Uh, so um, he's been trying to get a hold of members of Congress here in the United States to advise them, to explain to them what's going on. He's been, he had been warning for months and months and months that there was going to be some kind of massive explosion of violence in response to the Israeli government's actions and settler uh, pogroms in places like Kowada in the West Bank, which had uh, had suffered um, horrible violence carried out by Israeli government and settlers. And so he saw this coming. He had tried to alert Bernie Sanders' office, but was ignored uh, repeatedly and is still being ignored to this day by, um, by Sanders, who, you know, we can't even get to call for a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, so... I mean, I think, you know, if I can, I, th I think it's for one thing, it's very important for everyone to continue to go out and protest however you can to be active on social media. Um, the Biden administration is being is understands that there is there's public appetite for more and more mass destruction and genocide and is is not there. Uh, most Americans want a ceasefire in Gaza and don't want to see more pictures of, of dead babies. Um, and so it's important to continue to make that message heard, to, to, to attend whatever demonstration you can, whether you go to a big city, if you can, or if it's in your town or wherever you are. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, what we're looking at is now Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure. He's not, he's, he's coming under pressure by the United States, uh, to end this genocide in Gaza in at least the military dimension of it in the next few weeks. That's what's being reported, at least as of today, Monday, uh, November 13th. Um, and the Israeli mil and he's in a basically battle with the Israeli military command who he has publicly blamed for October 7th. And also hmm. that military wants to carry out a big um, bombing operation on Lebanon, which would, of course, start a full-on war with Hezbollah. Right now, it's kind of more lower level. But the United States um, is hesitant. It does not want to get involved in a war with Hezbollah and Iran, because that can you know, really destabilize the situation. And so is, is telling the political figures, Netanyahu, 
don't do this. So Netanyahu's in a real tight spot. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's keeping his political career alive is keeping this war going. So, I mean, there's a huge, huge divide in Israeli society among those who don't trust Netanyahu and those who don't trust any kind of government. Um, And I think Israel is going to come out of this severely weakened politically, militarily. It's not going to be able to accomplish its goals of defeating Hamas as it said it would from the beginning. It's just going to it's just shown that it is expert at slaughtering uh, civilians, but is not really capable of doing much militarily, uh, despite, you know, the billions and billions the U.S. gives it um, and its advanced militarily, its advanced military. So just important for everyone to to go out and uh you know if if you're feeling too you know depressed and sad go take a walk get some air outside um gather yourself and and you know it's a it's a long it's a long battle and 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 those of us on the side who are really on the side of peace and justice and democracy um i think we're eventually gonna win it's just gonna take some time and devotion amen yeah it's an emergency i mean that's how i think of it it's we have to do this. So. Thank you, sir. Um, and just, I don't have to tell you this, but keep going. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk soon. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thad, so much for having me. All right. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the unreported news analysis show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.